Welcome to this webinar, talking and listening to children and families putting kit bag to work. My name is Gillian Roosh, I'm Professor of Social Work at the University of Sussex. This webinar has been delivered um, in association with Exchange um, in Wales. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk with you about some research that was undertaken um, a few years ago in relation to how social workers communicate with children the Talking and Listening to Children project, TLC as it's been abbreviated to, and a resource kit bag which I've since um, become involved with and want to share with you in relation to how it can enhance and improve your communication skills. I'm going to say a little more about kit bag in a moment, um, but in order to start this session I wanted to use a component that's within kit bag which um, comes from the mindfulness tradition. Kitbag is um, a resource that's been designed particularly to help promote the social and emotional literacy of all children. But obviously it can have a particular benefit um, for us when we're working with children who perhaps experience trauma, um, are separated from their birth families, have all the experiences that are very familiar to us with the sort of children that we're working with. And in Kitbag, there are what are called presence cards. And these cards um, have an invitation on them to just um, invite you to be still for a moment, um, centre yourself really, um, allow yourself to become a bit regulated. And it's a lovely, very short exercise. It takes a minute, you get a little timer. Here's, here's the presence card. And um, you, um, with the child that you're working with, or children that you're working with, or a family, might just sit for a minute at the beginning of a session, or whenever feels appropriate, um, and take a minute together to focus on what you're being invited to do. So what I would be doing if I was with you in the room live, I'd be asking you now to plant your feet firmly on the ground, um, to sit upright with your back away from the chair, um, but not ramrod upright, just so that your vertebrae fall into place. Um, to have your hands gently relaxed on your lap in an, uh, in an open position, not sort of clenched. Uh, and to cast your eyes down or to close your eyes, whatever feels most comfortable. So I'd invite you now as we're um, going through this webinar um, and as you engage with it in your own time, um, to just take a moment for this exercise. I'll read the invitation on the card and then we'll take a minute with the timer and then at the end I'll just invite us back together again. So, the invitation. Imagine a really stormy lake gradually becoming calmer and calmer until it is glassy still. Okay. I'm always surprised when I do this exercise um, how long a minute feels and sometimes it feels um, longer and sometimes it feels shorter and anything like this is something you can do with children. You may think gosh some of the children I'm working with there's no way they could sit for a minute. Actually there's all sorts of stories um, of children being able to manage things that we don't think they can and if they don't manage it it doesn't matter. It's important information that you will have gathered about whether they can or can't and that on some occasions they might feel more able to and others they don't. Towards the end of this session I'll say something about the importance of rituals and routines for children 
So actually one of the affordances of kit bag, I think, is that you can take it along and there can be a pattern and a rhythm to your engagement with it with children. Whether the children on some occasions don't want to use parts of it or can't engage with this tool, as I said before, that's fine. That's information for you. It's not right or wrong. It's whatever happens, happens. And that's what you can think about in relation to where that child is at that particular moment. And a second um, component of kit bag is what's called the, the feelings card. Um, and as you can see um, on this card, there are 12 different colors. The idea behind this component is that children often don't know what to call their feelings. They often don't have the right emotional um, labels, terms to explain what it is they're feeling at any point in time. So the idea of this card is that children are invited to identify with a colour or maybe several colours um, to try and explain what it is um, that they're feeling. And, and quite often, perhaps as you start using this card, it might be that um, a child says, you know, I'm feeling yellow because it's a sunny day. Um, it may be a very sort of concrete um, account of what they're feeling. But gradually over time, as children become more familiar with it, their explanation of what they're feeling in relation to colour can undoubtedly become more, more nuanced and sophisticated as their emotional literacy grows, as they see you modelling something through it, because not only obviously do you ask the child what they're feeling, but you say something of what you're feeling. And what it invites into the room is a conversation about feelings which otherwise can be quite difficult to start or can feel quite um, artificial. This can feel quite a playful way. There's something about kit bag that is a, a playful form, but generates serious you know, outcomes, serious information, serious um, data in a way for you for what's going on with the child. Um, and again, if the child can't uh, identify a colour that day or just isn't interested in the card, so be it. You don't force it. You just notice that on this particular occasion, um, the child's not interested, not able to. Um, and these are important ways of beginning to notice um, through the process, through your relationship with the child, um, what's happening, rather than perhaps having that list of questions in your head. How is school at the moment? What's going on at home? Um, you can get as much information through these um, process-based understandings of the child as you can from a linear kind of questioning that might in your head fill in the assessment form that you've got to write or the review document, um, but actually might not be as authentic and accurate an account of where the child really is. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background to how I came across kit bag and the research that has informed um, what I'm going to share with you today. So the Talking and Listening to Children um, project, which has a website, and these images are from the website, and it's um, you know, open access, and there are um, learning resources on there that you can freely access, um, and information about the project and papers connected to it. Um, but the project was an Economic and Social Research Council funded um, study which took place across the four countries of the UK. Um, the data that I'm going to share with you in this session comes from phase one where we were involved in um, observing eight teams, two in each of the UK countries, um, representing all the different types of teams that you'll be familiar with, you work in, children with disabilities, duty teams, long-term teams, teams that maybe cover all those different elements if they're more integrated in the way that they deliver the service. Um, but essentially we were observing social workers going out and visiting children in their homes primarily, but also in schools, when they perhaps went out and took children to cafes or went out into parks with them. Engaging in all the normal everyday encounters that social workers have with children. So there was nothing unusual or exceptional. You would recognise any of the visits that we did um, as the work that you do on a day to day basis. So the researchers in each of these settings would follow the social worker out onto the visit um, and talk to them on the way about what it was that the visit was for and what they were hoping to get out of it. 
They then observed the visit. They didn't video or audio record. They just took detailed field notes. And then on the way back to the office or wherever they were next going, the researcher would ask the social worker how they felt the visit had gone, whether it had achieved what they'd hope it would achieve and, and what their sense of it was. Two other phases just acknowledged here was um, a second phase where we did more detailed observation of interactions using video and a third phase, which is um, the development of CPD materials, which are accessible on the website. And these were the four questions that we were asking, and they're not rocket science questions by any means, but what we discovered when we began to write the proposal for funding for this research was how little was actually known about these everyday encounters that social workers had with children. We knew indirectly what social workers said happened and what they found worked and didn't work and their overall sense of their, their engagement with children. And we knew what children thought about social workers. But what we didn't have was uh, direct data of what went on in these encounters. So that's what we were specifically wanting to get. So what are social workers observed to do when they communicate with children and young people in a range of settings with a range of aims? How do practitioners experience and understand their communication with, with a child or a young person? How do children and young people experience and understand their relationship with social workers? So getting both perspectives here. And what factors best facilitate communication between social work practitioners and children and young people? And when we um, had completed the research um, and analysed our, our data, um, people began to ask us, you know, well, what makes for an effective communication? What makes for a good communication with a child? Um, and the more we thought about it, the more we realised that was a question that actually our research had not enabled us to answer. And that might seem to be quite frustrating um, because that's what people want. They want um, a fairly straightforward, um, what do I need to do in order to do this well? Um, and we weren't able to offer a kind of checklist of techniques or approaches that social workers um, needed to demonstrate in order for a communication to be deemed good. Rather, what we found um, was this. Perhaps one of the most important things that we can't emphasise enough is each encounter with a child is unique. Each child is unique in how they experience whatever it is that has brought them to the attention of a social worker. Um, so if a child is referred because of concerns around physical or sexual abuse, um, neglect, exploitation, whatever it might be, how that child experiences those circumstances is unique to them. And that must be at the forefront of our mind. So you can immediately see why it's almost impossible to say, this is what you need to do in order to do good social work. But perhaps the one thing we can say is, in order to do good social work, you need to treat every child as unique. That's the first um, imperative um, and the biggest challenge. Secondly, communication between children, young people and their social workers is framed by the complex context in which it takes place. And by that, we mean both the family context, the immediate social circumstances of the child and the wider context, both within their community. So it might be about um, issues of um, in Northern Ireland, um, religion in particular is a backdrop to the child's experience there. And we've got some data that talks about that. Um, it might be about the wider social and political context. So obviously now with the COVID pandemic context we're working in, that's had a profound impact on how you're communicating with children and their families. It might be to do with issues of race. Black Lives Matter, again, has, has surfaced that very appropriately and importantly um, in our thinking at the moment. And, and the wider context, again, of austerity and the impact of poverty on the lives of the families that we work with. So each child needs to be thought about uniquely within the unique circumstances that they themselves are living, both more intimately and more, more widely in society. 
And social workers need to use their skills sensitively and creatively to make spaces for communication with children and young people. And again, what this um, might seem a, a dead obvious thing, and you might say, why did you need to conduct research to do that? Um, one of the things we found was the um, surprising number of social workers who didn't use any particular resource to communicate with children. Across our sample of 82 visits, um, only um, about a quarter of social workers used something, whether it's pens and paper, particular toys or games that they found useful. Um, and this was a real surprise to us um, and was something we didn't want to have a judgment on. And all that we're talking about here is not about judging practice, but trying to be curious about how this situation has arisen. What is it that has led social workers to be practicing in this way, largely not using any child friendly um, resources to um, inform and help their engagement? And the final finding. Um, that the relationship we have with children is more important than the communication itself. What we frame as a good relationship will forgive a poor communicative encounter. So we may feel we go on a visit and we don't get it right in some way, although we perhaps argue about the language of right and wrong. Um, but certainly we don't feel it was particularly effective. We didn't um, achieve what we hoped to achieve. But if that child um, trusts us, can rely on us, knows us to be consistent um, in what we do, then the fact that maybe on this occasion things didn't feel they'd gone very well won't matter if that child knows that you know, you're reliable, you're going to be coming again, um, that you're listening to them. Um, and these aren't easy things necessarily with all the demands on social workers and the short time frames that they have to be engaged with children often you know just doing very few visits and deciding then whether the case is open or closed or even when you're involved longer term with a child feeling that the time that you have that you can spend with them is often quite compromised so the way we conceptualize this is what we call the ecological model for communication and here you see what's already been articulated in the bullet points the uniqueness of the child at the center what we've referred to as the case, which is their, their family circumstances, really, the reason for the referral, um, the immediate context in which the child is located, and then the wider context, the social and political context in which the child is living at this particular time. And it's thinking about these three dimensions of what we call the 3C model um, that can be really helpful in thinking about how you effectively engage with children. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do now is share some data um, to try and demonstrate something of the um, challenge that arises when social workers are doing a home visit um, to a family. In the case, the first case that I'm going to share with you um, is one where the social worker has a, um, an established relationship with the mother with two children um, where there are concerns about the children's well-being. And I want to again just emphasise um, in sharing this data and perhaps trying to highlight some of the challenges that social workers face, it's not to pass judgment on this practice, but it is really trying to understand and be curious about what are the demands that are placed on social workers and the nature of the job that they're trying to do that can make it so difficult to effectively make connections um, and communicate well with children. So I've referred to these um, next few slides as listening with the head, points of disconnection. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is perhaps how if a social worker goes in with a particular mindset um, of what their responsibility and task is, it can really prevent them from being attuned and open to the communications that children might be giving that are not part of a linear, perhaps more adult way of relating but actually come in quite unexpected ways um, that can be picked up on if the social worker is attuned to them and not expecting children perhaps to communicate in that more adult question and answer way that we are as adults familiar with. So listening with the head is about being driven particularly by the kind of organisational demands um, when you're doing a visit and being less attuned from what you'll see coming later, the heart in terms of the immediacy and the emotional temperature of the space that you're currently occupying with the family. 
So this data comes from an observation of a family um, being visited in Northern Ireland. And the significance of this is that at the point at which this visit was done, it was the marching season in Northern Ireland. Um, so political feelings, political and religious feelings will be running quite high. And there will be a lot of um, activity in the wider context um, for this family in terms of the marching that goes on on the streets um, and the, the sense of kind of, um, I'm not sure whether celebration's quite, quite the right word, but just marking this occasion with its political and religious significance. So the social worker says, hi, Elaine, and Elaine says, hi, and shakes my hand. Um, and that's the research. This is the research's field notes. Alicia, who's six, is in the corridor with a plastic toy in her hand. It's a mini bongo drum with bells. She's shaking it at us and smiling. Ethan, who's seven, has a toy whistle that he blows at us as we enter the hallway. So what, this, what the reflection of the researcher is, oh sorry, I'll just read this bit. Um, in the front room, the social worker says, hello, Alicia, what's this you've got? Pointing to the toy, but doesn't wait for a reply as she's then led to the front room by Elaine. So the social worker here reflects on what she's observed in this visit. It feels like we're being welcomed into the house by a musical fanfare hosted by the children who use a whistle and a bongo drum to make noises as we enter. And I think this is a lovely observation of um, the context in which these children are being visited, which as I say was the marching season and seems to be reenacted in the house. So there's a sense of them being aware that's going on around them. Um, the social worker sort of notices it but you can feel here is already demonstrating the challenge for social workers of relating and being the social worker for both the parent and the children. So she makes an effort to acknowledge Alicia, but can't sustain it because already Elaine is trying to get her attention and taking her off to have a conversation. And I think this is a particular challenge that social workers have. How do you divide your time with the adults who themselves often have quite strong um, childlike needs for attention? So it can feel that you've got the competing forces of um, a number of children, perhaps more than sometimes, you know, some adults and some children. And how do you set that up and negotiate with the family how and where you'll spend your time? So in a sense, this social worker's got hijacked in the situation and taken over by the mum, trying to alert the children that she's noticed, but then being pulled back to mum. So we go on. Elisha drapes her legs over the armchair to face the TV, which is still on. So already we've got this competing issue of how do we have people's attention? There's a television on and that's quite distracting. Ethan doesn't come into the front room, but listens in from the corridor. Elaine begins to talk while Alicia continues to make noise with her toy in the background. So what we observe here is that the children haven't really been sufficiently addressed for them to feel confident that perhaps if they go away, um, the social worker will have said, I'll talk with you in 20 minutes after I've talked with your mum. There's a sense in which they're curious about what's going on, so they can't detach themselves entirely but also they may not feel confident that they can have any of the social workers time because what was reported on the way to the visit was that the social worker has a good relationship with the family, the children like her. Um, so there's something a bit compromised going on and the reflection from the observer, the children are there physically waiting for the conversation with them to begin. They know it happens and or are curious about what mum and social worker are talking about. So how do we create appropriate boundaries so that the children don't have to hear everything? Because actually adults have to have conversations without children sometimes. Ethan pops his head around the door frame and the social worker says, are you being shy today? Elaine explains that he had his sports day yesterday and that he won a bronze medal. She also confirms that she's been talking to the school about his epilepsy. And the social worker says that's good and Ethan disappears into the corridor again. So again, here's the social worker being torn in in two directions and sort of nodding towards the children, but not being able to fully engage. I think the reflection there had got a bit confused. Um, 
social worker goes on to talk about the testing of Ethan's IQ, which is still being processed. And Elaine says that no one is sure what health trust Ethan falls under, so they can't do anything to find that out. And then Elaine goes on about epilepsy, nurse, speech and language, occupational health and school nurse appointments that are coming up. So you can immediately imagine that the reflection here is about the more the conversation goes on and gets deeper, and the more the complex issues come to the surface, it's hard not to feel overwhelmed by the sheer volume of issues and to ensure that communication stays meaningful for all involved. And that again, it isn't an unfamiliar, I think, experience for those of you listening to this, where there's a sense in which a parent will give you their own sense of overwhelm with the amount of information they give you, their sense of feeling uh, maybe out of control with things. And by sharing it with you, in a sense, they give their difficulty, their pain, their confusion, their overwhelm to you, which might leave them feeling better, but leaves you feeling what they're feeling. So being able to name that sense of overwhelm can be a very important way of helping um, the mother come to terms with what it is she's trying to manage. So if then we try and theorise this a little bit, um, what might be helpful conceptual ideas and frameworks that can um, inform our thinking about these sort of encounters? Because I'd suggest there's nothing apart from the Northern Irish context that's unusual about that data and that um, encounter. Um, really a lot going on, a lot of uncertainty, um, parent having needs, children having needs. And this is where I want to turn to social pedagogy as um, an approach that has some important and helpful principles, which in this country aren't so widely used in social work contexts, but certainly in Europe on the continent, um, social pedagogy is a much more established discipline and profession and has a lot of very helpful ideas, I think, which can inform our social work practice. And the first of them is this um, German term, Haltung. And the nearest I think we can get to this in terms of translation is the word attitude. It's, it's a way of being. Um, so it's awareness, attunedness, empathicness, if there is such a word, um, to the whole situation for um, a family. Um, and it's something that I think one develops over time as one becomes more experienced as a practitioner, um, but also perhaps some people more intuitively have a Haltung attitude, their ability to be at ease with people um, and to express interest and concern in all aspects of everybody's lives. It's also something I think that can definitely be um, developed. Um, so it's not simply an innate trait that you have or you don't have. It's something that over time you can become more aware of yourself. In social pedagogy, they talk about head, heart and hands, so that the way that you engage with people is across all three of those domains, so that you engage in a thoughtful way, so that you will have perhaps theoretical frameworks that are informing the way you're engaging with a family, that you're doing it in an empathic way, so you're demonstrating your understanding of how distressing a situation might be, or able to celebrate when something positive, like Ethan's gold medal um and that you do something so there's a practical dimension to it so that um quite often i think these days social workers feel quite constrained in terms of whether they can um, express something perhaps through doing something helping a family out we get so constrained by the bureaucratic demands of our role that maybe just offering to take a parent to an appointment um, or to, to make something easier in some way for them is something that we don't um, so naturally do. Um, and it's worth thinking about because actually in research, it's shown that those social workers that go, what was referred to in this research by De Beer and Cody was go the extra mile, are the ones that uh, families say they really appreciate, they feel understood by because something has been done that indicates the social worker's understanding of their situation. The common third speaks to this kind of hands bit of head, heart and hands. It's about activities or um, ways of relating that have an extra dimension. So it could be um, taking a game along 
to play with a child, to begin to build that relationship. It could be going for a walk. Um, it could be um, taking the children somewhere. Um, it could be um, taking the parents somewhere in order, as I say, to, to make it easier, perhaps saying, I will take you after the visit, you know, um, down to the shop so that you don't have to worry going out in the rain or whatever. It's something that mediates the relationship. And then the three, what are called the three pedagogic P's, the personal, the professional and the private dimension of yourself. And this table um, helps us think about this. Um, so in terms of the three P's across the top, and you'll be familiar with this from your qualifying training, whether it was recent or a long time ago, things like Jahari's window in relation to what is visible to people and what is invisible. And in social pedagogic terms, um, they think about the professional self as essentially, you know, your qualification, your training, your competence. And that's informed by theory, knowledge of law, policies, procedures, um, practice frameworks, the kind of what might be called the kind of hard forms of knowledge. And the way this is demonstrated is by your ability to analyse the situation, apply particular methods, perhaps use a signs of safety approach or a strengthening families model, um, and your ability to evaluate the quality of what's gone on, your encounter. And from a professional perspective, your um, predominant preoccupation is other people, trying to understand what it is they need. In this middle column about the personal self, um, it's referred to here as subjective objectivity. So trying to get a good understanding of yourself in order to be able to use yourself, the idea of the use of self being such a critical part of social work practice so that you understand your own experiences, you're aware of the sort of things that might perhaps trigger difficulties for you, um, and you become aware of which of those experiences are more processed and um, less likely to impact on the way you respond to a family situation, as opposed to those that might be still rawer, less digested, and perhaps needing some additional attention. Um, and the way the personal self is manifest in um, these relationships is your um, understanding, your intuitive understanding of the situation and your capacity to be attuned and empathic. And from this perspective, you're thinking about other people's needs, but you're also recognising your own and seeking the support that you need in order to make sure that your own needs don't in any way impair the engagement that you have with a child and their family. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the third column, the private self, subjectivity um, and emotional um, foundations of your engagement. So this is the element that perhaps you either choose not to make visible or you don't even yourself know because it may be sufficiently unprocessed experiences that remain in your unconscious but that may by particular circumstances of a family become closer to the surface for you in a way that you might need again support for and the way this is demonstrated is by your emotional responses to situations and by chance things that you're not uh, necessarily expecting and the preoccupation here is on your own circumstances so if the private self is taking up more kind of time and emotional capacity, it may be that further work needs to be done outside of your professional context to address those issues. Because ideally your um, focus in your work should be on the combination of your professional and personal selves and how they can be put at the service um, of a family and children in particular. And obviously the key vehicle for these things being thought about is through supervision and the importance of you having um, reliable and reflective supervision to help you manage these aspects of yourself. So where I want to come now is um, to think about um, the, uh, the, the obverse really. I'm sorry, I'm just going to stop for a moment and move because a very noisy machine has come nearby and I think it's going to interrupt us. Um, what I've referred to here as listening with the heart. 
And this is the, um, the other side of really listening with the head and both are important um, and need to be held in I think a creative tension with each other. If we're just in our heads, we're perhaps not attuned to the emotional um, dimensions and dynamics in the relationship. If we um, are just in our hearts, we're not um, retaining the professional task and responsibility that we've got in relation to the particular visit we're doing. So on this occasion, in one of our um, English sites, um, social worker has gone to, to meet Chloe, and Chloe was um, a primary school aged child um, living on a farm. And the social worker talks to Chloe about when she helps out on the farm and she's leaning forwards towards Chloe, keeping um, eye contact, mirroring Chloe's enthusiasm and interest. So just the bodily engagement here is not unimportant, I think, the closeness she's got to Chloe. Uh, Chloe mentions her dog and the social worker asks Chloe what her dog's name is and then continues to ask questions about the dog by its name. So showing that she's heard and listened. Um, and Chloe seems happy to chatter away about this. The social worker follows the chatter of Chloe in this way for about 10 minutes. She then pauses and says, now Chloe, I've come here today to see how you are. And something again that we discovered through our research was how many social workers really struggled to articulate to children what it is they were there to do. And I think that's something when we come to think about kit bag in a minute um, that, um, kit bag can particularly help with. How do we say um, that we're here to try and think about the child's well-being um, and their safety? So the social worker goes on, she's speaking in a gentle and low tone and smiles while she talks. She gets out some things on the table and goes to her bag and while she does so she asks Chloe if she can remember what they did last time and Chloe nods. The social worker says, do you remember my special, oops, sorry, my special pencil case? Chloe giggles and nods and says that there was a special marble in it. The social worker smiles and raises her eyebrows to look impressed and says, that's right. Well remembered, Chloe. So here we have a, just a lovely little example of the value of doing, having something routinized or a little ritual um, that helps the child feel connected. Um, and knows that between times, in a way, there's something holding them in connection with the social worker and that that um, item will come on subsequent occasions. So it builds continuity into the relationship. And this, again, is something I think that Kitbag has particular, particular ability to do. The social worker sits back at the desk and hands Chloe her pencil case and shows her a large A3 piece of paper. She asks Chloe if she would draw a picture of herself for her and Chloe nods enthusiastically and starts picking through the pencil case as the social worker invites her to pick whatever colours she wants. Chloe starts to draw a picture and the social worker asks if she's okay with the height of the chair and Chloe tries to bounce the chair closer to the desk. The social worker pushes her in and asks if that is better. So just that little detail of being attentive to was Chloe sitting comfortably essentially um, I think is a really lovely example of that haltung, that attunement, this social worker's body language, um, non-verbal responses, her smiling, her eyebrow raising, her attention to Chloe's well-being, is all part of demonstrating being, um, being totally kind of there for the child, that your main purpose is to be attentive to that child and children will pick that up. They know what's authentic and they know when somebody's acting with integrity and with their interests at heart. And this quote came from actually um, a workshop that we ran in relation to the Talking and Listening to Children project. So it isn't from the data from the project, but um, somebody just realising in light of this workshop what had happened in an encounter and how important it was. I had my nails painted absolutely hideous the other day, but it felt like such a privilege. And it was actually a really bonding thing to do because this little girl was holding my hands and it was a real connection. So it's a lovely example of somebody recognizing what is valuable about this encounter. 
it's not necessarily that you've got some um, definitive information which we rarely get about what's going on but that this child um, can do this with somebody can relate to somebody can feel sufficiently confident to hold their hands all this is important information but of course in our current context um, with our virtual communication being the, the primarily what primary main way in which we're engaging with children you know what might be an equivalent of nail painting how can we forge those links and those connections um, albeit through through a screen so to summarize the points of connection and disconnection i think it's something like this if we're connecting with children and when we connect we do communicate we're doing it in a focused and personal way so that we are making sure that the child is the center of our attention. So in that example of Chloe, the time was being spent on her own with Chloe. The social worker perhaps in that first example with Ethan and Alicia may be needed to set out with them at the beginning. I'm going to talk with mum for 20 minutes, then it'll be your turn and we'll talk for 20 minutes. What actually happened at the end of her visit, having spent most of the time with the mother, the social worker then sat with Alicia and Ethan and got out of her bag the, um, the pieces of paper with sort of different smiley faces on to express emotions and asked them to circle which one they were feeling. Um, and whilst that's not an inappropriate exercise, um, I was certainly left wondering with, given the information the social worker had got, um, inadvertently through the visit, the bongo drums and the welcome, the information about the medal that Ethan had got. Um, it might have been that she could have engaged in a more attuned way to where the children were um, that she knew about, rather than introducing what might be seen as quite a formulaic way of capturing how are you feeling today. Um, so I raise that just as a thought for you to think about. Um, again, just wondering how sometimes we can become a bit um, limited in our imagination as to how we can understand and engage with children. It's about being respectful. So respectful, I think, would be about being attentive to what they're telling you at that moment, um, rather than necessarily bringing in your own agenda. Um, because often if you stay with the child, you will learn what you need anyway, and need to have confidence that that's the case. And then connection means that the children feel physically and psychologically held. So physically held by the boundaries of, I'm going to give 20 minutes to you at the end when I've had 20 minutes with mum, whatever it might be, or I'm going to come and see you next time. When I come next time, I'll just talk with you. And this then also gives them a sense of being psychologically held. And the example of the pencil case as that point of continuity for Chloe with her social worker. I think is a lovely um, example of being able to hold children in mind between visits so that when you come and show that that pencil case is, is there and was there last time, those children feel that they've been held in mind. Whereas if it's rather chaotic and it's not structured well, or there aren't these um, symbolic ways of feeling connected in between visits, children can feel quite psychologically and physically dropped which is often the experience they've had with their own parents, which is why we're involved with them. So it's something that we as social workers want to try and avoid at all costs. So again, um, a reflective and rhetorical question here at the bottom for you. How do our current virtual engagement arrangements impact on how we connect with children? What would you be saying about that? And what are the challenges that you face in light of our, our virtual world? <clears throat> Okay, so for the final part of this session, I just want to come on and tell you something about Kitbag. Um, and this link here is to a very nice sort of short film about Kitbag and its application, um, which you will see in the film. Um, it's a resource that can be used by children and young people of any age and adults. So it gets used particularly where it started in Scotland, in schools, in primary schools. But equally, it's been used in secondary schools with young apprentices going out to um, workplaces. Um, it's used as a mini kit bag version, which is used in organisations with professionals. And the idea behind it um, in all those different applications is to help people become more socially and emotionally literate. 
So inviting people to be able to articulate what it is they're saying in order to improve their functioning in their daily life, that emotions don't become obstacles and barriers, um, but they are um, expressed and therefore can be worked through and lived with. And the different ingredients in the kit bag here are explained um, in a, um, a nice blog by Margaret Hanna, who's the creator of Hit the Kit Bag, about how does kit bag work. So I'm not going to say anything particular about them now, um, but I'll just show you some examples from people who've used it um, to give an illustration of, of, of its application in practice. So this was somebody talking about how she understood what she should be doing um, with children before engaging with the talking and listening to children research and how it presented things. At the beginning when I was doing assessments I was talking to the parents and whenever I met the children I'm interviewing them rather than doing stuff with them. Now I've realised that I can actually play or do things with children and actually still get information out of them. So yes, after the last, over the last six, seven months, there's been a noticeable change for me. So this newly qualified social worker had taken part in talking and listening to children workshops and through the course of them um, had discovered that actually play was the medium through which information could be gathered. So this idea of kit bag being a playful form for serious memes um, is perhaps a really um, lovely example of this through the activities that Kitbag has within it, important information can be gathered and it avoids you feeling like you're in a kind of interrogative situation with young children having to ask them all these questions. And I realised I said young children then, but it could be, as I've said, any child and equally families. It's a very good resource to use with families altogether. So there's the link to um, the blog by Margaret Hanna, which really helpfully describes all the different elements of Kitbag. So here's an example from another workshop where we're introducing kit bag. I'd like to use these kit bags to really explore the feelings of the child from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. A really excellent observation. By allowing them to open ended, to use open ended play exploration, it allows the communication to be on their terms and it allows them to take the lead and shows us the social worker what they want us to know instead of us guessing what they want to tell us. So having confidence that the child can give you the information you need without you having to kind of batter them with questions. So what might you need to achieve this kind of inside out perspective rather than outside in? And somebody else being introduced to Kitbag said, I'm going to use the kit bag for myself in the car before and after visits or meetings. I'm hoping this will clear my mind and reset me. Um, again, I thought this was a really interesting understanding of how valuable kit bag can be, not just for the children and the families, but for you as a professional to just take that minute like we did at the beginning of this session. Um, somebody else I know has said that she um, uses the presence card. So if she's doing several visits back to back when we were doing visits face to face, she would take a minute between visits and use a presence card in order to sort of separate from the previous visit and allow her to be fully present for the next visit. And I thought that was an extraordinarily creative um, application of kit bag and very thoughtful about what she needed in that situation. So what's the digital context equivalent of transitional space afforded by you know, traveling to visits, whether by car or public transport or walking, whatever you do. How do we create these boundaries, particularly when we are visiting families from our home to their home through um, digital means? How can we protect our own well-being in order to be available to families? <clears throat> these cards on the right here are what are called the um, Oh, my mind's gone completely blank now what they're called. But essentially they have qualities of um, people. It's the easiest way of putting it really. Aspects of how we behave and experience life. They're not always necessarily emotions as you'll see, um, but dimensions of our relationships with each other. 
and um, they have animals as well which invite the children to make connections. The words and the animals don't always obviously connect, sometimes they do, um, but they create a lovely kind of talking space because sometimes it's the animals um, that younger children in particular um, are drawn to. Um, but you can open up conversations about sometimes qualities like honour which are not very easily understood in a way that perhaps success might be. Um, and this is a quote again of a social worker for the first time taking the kit bag and using these cards with this particular family. And I'm just going to pause for a minute to allow you just to read that quietly on your own. So fundamental to Kitbag is the idea that it's a child-led resource. So once a child has discovered what's in Kitbag, if you were to have one and take it on repeated occasions to visit um, a child in a family, um, you can simply take the kit bag and put it there and say, how shall we start? How shall we use it? And the child can be in charge of that. And on the um, International Futures Forum website where Kitbag is located, there are lists of the sort of games that children have um, invented. I've remembered now these are simply called the animal cards. Um, and there are lots of games, um, but essentially it's all about being able to um, recognize perhaps some of these qualities um, in yourself or in other people. And as this example says, you know, giving and receiving cards with these qualities on and saying why is an extraordinarily moving um, and um, powerful experience and it's if we were in the room together you'd be um, having an opportunity to do this and even as kind of you know well-functioning um, mature adults it can be quite touching to be given um, a card with a little account by the person why they're giving it to you because they feel you need more of it or because they recognize it in you um, and it makes us really aware of how often we don't talk in emotionally literate ways with each other we kind of assume people know more often than not. Another lovely example, which again, I'll just um, give you a moment um, to read in your own time. So I think this is a particularly helpful example of just showing how simply through having the cards there, well, A, Bella knows this resource. So here's the beginning of a kind of routine and a predictability around kit bag. She's in charge and she decides that she then wants to pick some for her mother. And then that creates an opportunity for the social worker to be able to share that with her mother and really build, I think, the emotional relationship between Bella and her mother but also between the social worker and the family. Um, so these are just lovely, um, rich examples, I think, of how kit bag can be so helpful. So as we come to the end of this um, webinar, um, what's occurred to me as I've been developing the thinking around the Talking and Listening to Children project is that actually it's really about listening and talking to children. It's the listening that we are less good at. Um, that we need to be more attentive to. And the talking can come in light of listening, I think. Whereas we tend to be a bit driven by, as I've said, our adult models of question and answer to get information. But all the information I would argue is there in the room, in your relationship with the child and their relationship with the people in their family. If only we can listen. And Kitbag is certainly a resource that increases the likelihood of our listening being of a better quality.
So a social worker saying here, I think I realised I was getting it the wrong way around as a newly qualified. I was going to every assessment and visit with such an agenda in my head. So here we have listening with the head. It's that agenda, that organisational agenda that is impacting on the capacity to be present to the child. I wrote here in the baseline assessment, I was worried about missing a vital bit of information in just playing. How awful, just playing. But I've written here, post assessment, the space has allowed me to think about how to encourage children to have a voice, but also to actually hear it. And it is in that playing, and I have just had the best fun. So what we really hope out of this research is that we can build on this understanding or misunderstanding perhaps of what talking to children is about. Be able to emphasize the need to listen and that we can listen through children's play because that is their primary form of work and their primary form of communication. And as we listen and talk to children, at the forefront should be our understanding, going full circle really, that children are unique and that we need to engage with their uniqueness. And part of their uniqueness is clearly how they identify themselves. And so we need to become more attuned to talking with children and listening to children to see how they express their identities. And to use this idea of the three C's model, the child case context, to get better understanding of the child's perspective on their own identity. And finally, I said I'd say something about rituals. And this is, I think, where Kitbag can be such a helpful resource, even if it's simply to bookend a visit. You have it there at the beginning, you might do an element of Kitbag, you have it there at the end. It doesn't need to take long. It might just be the minute timer, starting with it, finishing with it. What colour are you at the beginning in your feelings? What colour are you at the end of the session? However you choose to use it. Um, but as children become more familiar with it, they become more in control of it. They become more comfortable talking about their feelings. And we can create that possibility by being predictable and regular in how we introduce Kitbag and have confidence in its um, ability to facilitate emotionally charged conversations. Ritual and repetition have enormous significance for children of all ages. The sense of continuity and reliability that they evoke in children and adults, whose lives are often chaotic and unpredictable, cannot be overestimated and help to position the social worker as a reliable presence for the child and indeed their family and can be enacted over shorter or longer time periods. So even in one visit, a duty visit, you can offer something of this reliability, I would argue. And because the children that we've lived with, as it says, as we work with, have had such unpredictable lives so often, that regularity is even more important to them. And one of the kind of ambitions I have around Kitbag is that um, what if we could imagine that every local authority provided their childcare social workers with a kit bag? So this became the kind of emblem, the identifier for social work, as much as a stethoscope is for a doctor. Every child and family would know when the social worker visits that they have a kit bag. And this then becomes a means of continuity for children and for families through social workers, that if a social worker changes or a family moves authority, that a common means of communicating that will be present in any situation in the same authority across authorities uh, will be Kitbag. And that the children can be in charge of the communications that Kitbag um, facilitates. And I think that could be a really powerful statement by um, employers that they value the workers um, that they have and they want to equip them to be able to do the job they do to the best of their ability and currently that's not the case and it's something that we're really trying to champion um, particularly through Kitbag. It's not the only resource but it's certainly um, a resource that addresses the core task of social work to promote the well-being of children and protect their safety 
Um, and that's why I think it's got such um, power in our practice. So some reflective questions to leave you with, with an image of some social workers um, actually um, in Oxford, um, learning to think about how to use kit bag. So what do you find most challenging when communicating with children and how has COVID-19 impacted on your practice? What's that done to change things? What would help you develop your communication skills and how might kit bag help you? How does your organisation support you in your work? So one of the things from the talking and listening to children research was that most people that we spoke to had provided whatever they did use when they did use something themselves. And this is where this, this ambition for kit bag being something that's purchased and provided by employers um, is something that we are really trying to champion because it doesn't seem appropriate that social workers are having to pay for their own resourcing of their practice. Why is this not core um, provision from employers to help the people they employ do their job properly? Um, and important to say, and it might be something that your organisation is interested in, Kitbag is now available in an online version I don't think it um, replaces having a proper kit bag when you're engaging with children, but it certainly made it accessible in a way that previously it hadn't been. So if you go to the IFF website, International Futures Forum website, you'll find details of how your organisation for quite a small fee um, can get access to the online version and, and then um, have everybody in the organisation can access it. There's no limit to the number of licences. And finally, if a child you work, you work with were here today, what would they say they would like from social workers? The final slide just has some references um, to papers that we've written off the project. So um, I'll stop on these reflective questions and I hope that this has been um, informative, thought provoking. Um, please do get in touch with me um, at the University of Sussex if you're interested in finding out more or you have questions. And do look at the International Futures Forum website for details about Kitbag. Thank you. <laughs>